Okay. So a good morning to the 13, 14, 15 of you who are joining us live right off the bat. Um, good morning. This is Cup of Joe with uh, your town manager, Paul Balkaman, and special guest, Amherst Finance Director, Sean Mangano. I am Brianna, Communications Manager with a sore throat, so I'm going to um, try not to talk too much today. But um, before we get started, I will uh, remind folks who want to get in on the conversation, please raise your hand in Zoom. We will pull you into the room to ask your question. If you're joining us from the phone, like I see a couple of you are, press star nine. We can um, pull you into the room once you've raised your hand. We also have a Q&A function. Feel free to uh, post your questions there. So I'm going to let um, Paul give a little welcome and um, Sean as well. Thanks. So um, I'm glad. Thanks for showing up, even though you're feeling bad. I know you're feeling bit poorly, um, Brianna. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so the big topic of our day has been about vaccines, and we've put a lot of effort into that, led by our health director, Emma Dragon. Um, as you all know, that the state has shifted its focus to having vaccines distributed through these mass vaccination sites. One, of the closest one to us is the Eastfield Mall. Um, we're we've been running a really nice operation at the high school and at the bang center and we'd like to continue that um we're advocating to the state and with our support from our state rep and state senator uh that we would be partnering with um city of northampton which is what we've been doing they take the western part of hampshire county we take the eastern part of hampshire county to provide um, personalized in a way um, vaccine services for our large number of communities um, so we um, are seeking that support um, from the state to deliver this because there are no vaccination sites in Hampshire or Franklin County. Um, so uh, getting vaccines into the arms, especially since they opened it up to those 65 and older is a high priority for the town. We've dedicated an enormous number of resources. We have our uh, COVID hotline that's, that's staffed. Uh, we, we've added extra people to answer that phone. We try to answer as many calls as we can, we, we return every voicemail that's left. I think our reputation is growing. We're getting calls from across the state now, trying to get information. Um, and but we don't really, we can't really help people who are going through the state site for other locations. So we're, our commitment is to the town of Amherst. Um, so uh, we also have the senior center uh, fielding calls and, and reaching out to people individually. Um, we have a team that's really focused on the most vulnerable populations and the people who are homebound. So to get vaccines to those uh, more direct access to uh, who, who need that special attention. So a lot of work being put on getting the vaccine into people's arms. We think that's our highest priority as a, as a town right now and dedicating all as many resources as, as we need to do that. Communication is key. Um, Brianna's every morning um, working on the website, updating information with information from our health department. Just a lot happening. So, but I think to the public's point of view, the vaccine is, is important and it's important to us as well. But what about capital projects, Sean? <laughs> That's kind of important too. And not as important as the vaccine, um, uh, but going back to vaccine related stuff, one of the things we're working on a lot in the finance department is managing all the federal resources that are coming in to help make all of that happen. So um, I think everyone's heard about the CARES money and we've, we're trying to manage that. That program was extended by a year. Originally it was gonna end December 31st of 2020. That was extended till the end of 2021. So we're managing that moving forward. And then there's also FEMA reimbursements that come into this with a couple of different programs, one for the vaccine and then one for everything else. Um, and the rules keep changing um, as mm -hmm. more information comes out, uh, change in administrations. Um, it just it's constantly changing. So it's a it's a challenge to manage all these different resources to support everything that we need to do to contain the pandemic and get people vaccinated. So that's related to that on the capital front and budget front. We're sort of in the in the midst of that. Um, we're meeting with departments on their budget and reviewing their capital proposals and, and getting more information. And we had a busy week for capital, presenting the plan for the four building projects on Tuesday, and then presenting the capital improvement program to the joint capital planning committee last night. And that's going to continue next week with the library on Monday. So it's been a, a busy couple of weeks for capital. And, and we spent about what, 12 hours in budget meetings this week yes, as well. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> it was a busy week. For, with our department heads. <laughs> 
You guys just see dollar signs in your eyes right now. <laughs> we take away dollar signs from people. Oh, I wish. Yeah, right. <laughs> the opposite. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to take a quick chance to remind the folks in the room who might have joined late. We've um, we've got a lot of live attendees today. We'd love to hear from you live. You can raise your hand in Zoom, star nine from your phone, or pop your questions into the Q and A function right within the meeting. So just a quick little plug there. Yeah, so I just, this is like, a, remember how we would do these things at, at uh, different restaurants and we'd all sit around the table and people just throw their questions. So that's what we want this to be about. It's not a presentation. You're not going to hear a presentation. So folks, if you want to raise a question, raise your hand, come in, talk to us. That's what we want this to be. You, um, yeah, maybe it might be worth for folks who haven't kind of followed the whole history of this project. You know, last year we had before pandemic hit, we had a series of listening sessions, um, videos produced about the, the projects. Can either of you give like a, a quick little historical background on where, where this project, these projects came from and where we are now and what we're looking to do? I think where the projects came from before I was hired in, in the recruiting document, they actually, the select board at that time said, we have four major capital projects we have to address. And that was one of the, the biggest goals when they were hiring a new manager for over four years ago. And so that's been on the, on the um, docket for a long time. And I'm, it's just, this is the, um, you know, we had this failed school project um when the when the when it, the money wasn't borrowed for that and so that sort of set us back somewhat but this is the farthest we've gotten uh we're really in good shape i think with um the gr two grants for one for the library one for the schools um you know we are struggling with a location for the dpw that's the thing that's holding back that series of projects but there is no state funding for the for fire or dpw facilities so those are things we're going to have to do on our own um, a key component of the plan that uh, Sean presented on <coughs> uh, earlier this week on Tuesday uh, was that uh, in order for us, to, our mission from the council was figure out a plan that where we can do all four projects and tell us how you would do that, which is what we did. And one of the big constraints on it was we have to say, okay, we need a budget for each project and it's, and it's less than what everybody wants for the most part. And so we will put that budget in and the rest of the resources either have to come from the outside or we'll have to build to, to meet that budget line. So I think that's um, is sort of a, a challenge, especially for fire and, DPW, fire and DPW to say, okay, we have to throttle back what we have thought about. We could want it in our new facility, so. We've got a question. I think your explanation prompted some questions. So thank Good. you, Paul. <laughs> uh, please explain how a debt exclusion for capital projects would work. It is, it is a temporary increase in tax or once the project is paid off, property taxes return to normal with max two and a half increases. So, so there's two de types of, uh, there's three actually cap, uh, debt exclusions or um, overrides. One is a, if you purchase a capital thing and no one ever uses that. The two major ones is an operating budget override where the town votes to increase its taxes and that stays on forever. Um, and Northampton has used this um, every five or six years, they go out for a uh, debt exclusion for operating budgets and then that increases the taxes permanently. The other one, and, and it's the other one is the one that we use, which is a debt exclusion override. And so um, what it says is that when those um, payments for that debt come in, we will put those on the tax bill over and above the normal tax bill. And then as those payments ramp down, those extra payments on the tax bill ramp down. And then after 20 or 30 years, that extra payment goes off the books. That's not included into, in your tax bill anymore. Does that cover it, Sean, you think? Yeah, um, I think you might have accidentally, when you referred to Northampton, you might have said they do a debt exclusion override, oh. but, they, but they do just a, a general override, which is a permanent increase yeah. in taxes. Yep, thanks. All right, I'm gonna prompt again for questions. Anybody raise your hand, feel free. We'd love to hear from you live if you have, oh, here we go. I'm gonna allow uh, and invite Sarah in to, I'm gonna ask her to unmute and introduce. Are you there, Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah McKee in Chadwick Court in Amherst. Um, there are the four capital projects you've mentioned. The, however, 
we also have a we also have a water plant, water treatment plant, uh, the price of which has nearly doubled, I think, since the lightning hit it in 2018, it's up to 13 point something million. Um, we have roads, we have, I believe, some other capital projects. And I understand that the water treatment plant is not paid for out of taxes. Um, however, if your water bill goes up, does it matter really whether it goes up as part of, um, you'll remind me of the term, um, or the taxes? So what is the total tax or total payment increase uh, contemplated for the four capital projects plus the sort of hidden capital projects that also need to be taken care of if we, as a matter of the quality of our life. Thanks. Thank you for your question, Sarah. So I can start. Um, for the four building projects, the increase specifically related to those projects would be the for the one project that's debt excluded. Um, so there's a, in the presentation I gave on Tuesday, there's a range depending on your different property value of what you can would anticipate if that debt exclusion is approved. Um, what the annual increase would be, um, both sort of what the max would be in the early years and what the average would be over the life of it. Um, for the water, uh, for the enterprise fund project, the water fund, um, I would, we'd have to look at, to figure that out on a person by person basis based on their water consumption and what that's projected out over future years. Um, this year is a little bit unusual because UMass um, isn't this doesn't have as many students in town, so the water consumption dipped a little bit, and so we're tracking what that's going to look like in the future, and that spreads out the cost uh, more broadly across the town. Yeah, so so I think our mission was to uh, was how do we build these projects within the con within the budget that we have. And that's why when you hear us talk about 10% for capital, that means we're building, we're taking stuff from operating and moving it over to capital to pay off for these projects. So the mission, our mission, Sarah, was to um, do as much as we can without impacting the taxpayer. The, what we can't, what we can, what Sean said to the council or the finance committee on Tuesday, we can't do it for all four projects. That's why the school it was would recommended that it could be set out as a debt exclusion. That would be over and above. Um, you know, the, the um, plan also does recognize the need for our other capital needs for our buildings that that need imp investment for our roads and sidewalks that need investment. And we have really ramped up our investment in roads and sidewalks over the last three years, anyway, uh, much more significantly than we had in the past um, by tenfold almost. Um, so, from the from the town's point of view, so um, so I think that we've recognized those ongoing capital needs as well. Um, in terms of the the um, water plant, it's something we're going to have to do. And you're right, it, I mean, if you tell uh, if, you, if you tell me I'm taking money out for taxes or a water bill, it's coming out of the same pocket. So we it, it's an impact on the on the rate payer and the property tax owner. So it is an impact. All right, I've got a couple of questions here in the queue and then some hands raised. So I'm gonna um, pose this one since it's kind of relevant to what you're speaking on right now. So today's Gazette suggested multiple overrides might be needed, but Sean's plan shows we can do all four projects with only one debt exclusion. So why might more overrides be necessary or desirable? So, so yeah, the, so the model we put forward only shows one. I think at various settings in the past, there's been discussion of more than one. However, one of the um, one of the principles that we built into our model was again to try to minimize the impact on taxpayers. Um, so the, the plan we put forward or the option we put forward only has one debt exclusion included. Um, it did reference that in the future, um, if something happened, if there was a recession or something happened where the town had trouble making the the amount needed to pay for all the capital projects on an annual basis, the, the percentage allocated towards capital, um, that there were a couple different options the town could consider. And some of those options were reduce um, 
shift more from the operating budgets. It could be do less for other capital project, other capital needs. Um, another option was use reserves. And then the last option that was put out there is something that, that could be considered would be potentially a second debt exclusion. But um, again, that was more for contingency planning of what if this happens in the future, the, the, the option we put forward just has one. Great, thank you. So I have some hands raised. I'm gonna invite my friend Ken into the room if you could unmute and introduce yourself. Good morning, thank, thank you. I'm Ken Rosenthal, 53 Sunset Avenue. Uh, I have a quick question and then a couple of comments I'd like a reactions to. The, the question is, where can we see this presentation, Sean? Mm -hmm. uh, I know that you're gonna be presenting something on the Jones Library Monday or what you've already presented, is there, can you tell us where to look for that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so the, on Monday, it's a broad presentation from lots of people um, associated with the library. I just have a small piece on what the financing schedules could look like. Um, however, the, the presentation from Tuesday is in the packet for finance committee, but we're also going to um, sometime today, uh, set up the, a web page dedicated to the four building projects and communicating information related to those projects. So there will be a link on that page and I'm, I'm sure Brianna will do a push out so everybody um, uh, knows where that is. And so we're gonna link up that presentation and other information um, to that page. So it'll be a, a, a one-stop place you can go to, to to get more information. Thanks, then uh, my, my quick comments. Uh, we know that the library proposal includes a major fundraising effort on the part of the library. I know that you have good people who can estimate costs of buildings, but have you assessed the ability of the library in these times to raise the money from private sources that they say they're going to need to raise? Because if they don't, then there's a big shortfall that's going to have to come on the shoulders of the taxpayers. That's the first. The second question is at a district three meeting last night, one of our counselors mentioned the problem of increasing uh, uh, taxes in Amherst uh, to the point where he said that when his wife retires, they might have to leave the town because they would be unable to stay. Uh, I have friends in Hadley who kind of smile at us in Amherst and say, thank you for the people you're sending us because you are sending us people who no longer feel comfortable paying the taxes in Amherst and our taxes in Hadley are so much less. I'm very fortunate. I can pay the taxes that you're charging me now and I want to stay in Amherst for the rest of my life, but I worry about people who are going to be driven away or the people who are not going to be able to come here in the first place because of the rising tax base. And I, that's a comment. I know you may not want to react to that, but I think it's on the minds of a lot of people, especially with four projects that are going to cause increase in taxes. Thank you for listening. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah. Ken, that's a, that's a, those are really important points, and, I, and we do recognize the um, taxes in Amherst are very high, and, and that people are sometimes struggling to to do the, to pay them. Um, the town has chosen, and over time, we have dedicated. Um, ex we have a full service community. We have full time paramedics on staff, twenty four hours a day. Um, to service the community. People have said, we want that as a priority for our community. There's lots of services that the town has, has chosen to um, supply that, um, a, that neighboring towns have not chosen to, to supply. Um, so it's a matter of choices and, and it costs money to do to provide the level of education and services that, we, that the town provides. So that's one of the, the challenges that we have. Plus, I mean, there's a lot of other reasons for it. One is we have a diminished tax base because so much of our land is is um, controlled by nonprofit institutions that don't pay taxes. So that large tax burden falls on fewer people. Um, and one of the challenges for the town is to broaden the tax base so there's less impact on our on on our regular property tax taxpayers. Um, you know, nobody likes to pay taxes um, and um, you know, I, I, I hate when people have to feel like they can't afford to live in our town. Um, it's, and I think there's a squeeze and a lot of town residents, you know, um, town employees who live here or have the exact same experience that, you, that you've just identified. So. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, that um, if people are struggling, there are a number of exemptions that um, 
our, our abatements that are open to people um, who might qualify. And we're going to do a better job moving forward of sending those out to people and laying them out clearly. Um, uh, what, uh, based on income levels or age, there's different um, ways that you could get a reduction in your tax bill. So we're going to um, start sharing that information out on this coming, the next round of tax bills that go out. Um, it was some, we received some feedback from the CPA committee as well, because there's exemptions related to CPA. Um, so we will be uh, putting that information out this year. Oh, and, and can you raise the idea, well, can the library raise the funds? And that's been a high level of concern by the town council as well. Um, like, okay, you say you can raise this money, prove it. And one of the things that the trustees have done is they said, we, we have um, an endowment that we are that we're looking at pledging in essence to guarantee you that that won't come back to the town um and so i think that's you know the town council is asking that precise question that you raised in terms of you say you're going to raise this money how can you guarantee that so we can it doesn't fall to the taxpayer yeah. and the monday presentation will um speak specifically to both of your points one about their progress towards meeting the fundraising goal, um, and then also more on the endowment. Um, so both of those will be addressed on Monday in pretty good detail. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank I, you. Do, I do see that we have another hand in the room. So Tony, if you could unmute and introduce yourself, please. Hi, uh, Tony Cunningham. Um, thanks for continuing to do these Cup of Joes virtually. Um, Paul, you said a little while ago, it's a matter of choices. And um, I saw the presentation the other day, which was very thorough, allocating more of the property tax revenue to capital uh, at the level sufficient to fund these four projects will mean really tough operating budgets for all town departments. I know Kathy Shane asked Sean how many years the, the presentation talked about the impact in 2023. Um, and Sean seemed to indicate that it would go further than that. Um, your presentation on Tuesday for that 2023 example showed holding operating budgets to one or 1%, one and a half percent. And we're already seeing what that means for the schools, the regional schools this year with a $1 million cut to their budget, uh, which will likely result in 16 job losses. So are you asking the departments to model going forward into future years, what that 1% or 1.5% one operating budget would do to their budgets. I know the fire department often says they're understaffed and the schools are really struggling to meet that 1% increase. Um, for, so my question is firstly, how long into the future, how many more years would that be required? Um, that one or one and a half percent operating budget increase? And will you be asking the departments to model what that would look like before any decisions are made to move forward with this plan? Thank you. So I can address the first part of that. Um, so the reason why we focused on 2023 is because that is sort of the, the big step up to where we need to be for capital funding. So we're, uh, for FY22, we're pro uh, projecting eight and a half percent for FY23, we're projecting that we have to get up to 10%. So increasing that percentage and a half is the big step. Um, so that's why we focused on that year. I, the presentation we gave was more of a hypothetical, but it was meant to give some context or some um, basis for people to consider because um, we had to project how much our revenue will, in will increase. We don't know exactly how much our revenue will increase for FY23. We use sort of a conservative figure, um, but but it was again, meant to be helpful for planning. Um, but after 2023, then it's a small step up uh, to get to 10 and a half percent for FY24. And then we stay there going forward. So we are projecting out maybe the next five or six years to show what that would look like. And we have to make assumptions around what revenues would increase, um, which you know always could change. It's, you know, could average out, but it's always gonna be a little bit different than what we project from year to year. Um, but 2023 is the most, um, the year with the most significant increase for capital spending. So that's why we focused on that. In terms of, you know, I think Tony, you're right. It, about, every budget is about choices and it reflects your values. And, um, you know, and to having sitting through all of our budget means every department says we need more resources to do the things that the town is asking us to do. Um, you know, Brianna nods her head. She knows IT is, is, <laughs> um, needs support. So you know, we have to make choices about what we can do and what we can't do. 
the school has had to make the same thing. They've sort of put their, their number out there as what they, um, every department is getting the same level of increase um, from, the, from the town budget. So we're all managing to that, to those numbers. Um, yeah, there's every department would like to have, we'd love to have additional firefighters and all these other things as well. Um, it's just a matter of what that, you know, we talked just recently about the high cost of services in the town and the impact on the taxpayer. So it, my job as town manager is to uh, manage that down um, to make sure we stay within our budget that we can afford. And we start with the revenues that we have and then go from there. Yeah, and, and I'll just add one sort of general comment about the presentation on Tuesday which is we did build in quite a bit of conservatism into the into it because it does project out a number of years. We didn't want to project a best case scenario. Um, so when you look at that, you know we're being conservative around interest rates, um, which are much lower right now than they are projected in that model. Um, so that's an area where things could certainly improve. Um, we're being conservative about the usage of reserves because we're saying that we're going to pull out um, a certain number of reserves, but we're not talking about what we're going to put in every year, which if you look back in history, we typically add to our reserves. Um, and so there, and there's a couple other areas where, again, we're really, we're trying to be conservative so that we know things are gonna change. There's so many variables that are in this model, um, but if we lean conservative when they change, we'll have more flexibility. Great, and I've got a bunch of questions coming in. Thank you, Tony, for your thoughtful question. So um, anybody who has follow-ups, feel free to just raise your hand. I'm going to go to some of the, the Q&A for a moment here because we've got some of those stacking up. Uh, Nancy wants to know, could you explain the current plan for the school construction projects? What's going on with Fort River renovation? And are we still hoping for a new school building? Yeah. Um, so uh, Right now we are in an MSBA, Mass School Building Authority process um, of which Paul and I are on the building committee along with several others. And that committee is looking at um, two possible options. Um, uh, I'm not gonna get the enrollments right, but there, there's a couple different enrollments. One that would address both buildings, um, Fort River and Wildwood. So that is still moving forward and we're at the process right now where we're um, trying to procure an owner's project manager, which is a position that essentially represents the town and they do a lot of the logistics and the scheduling and making sure that the designer um, is doing what we're, what the building committee and the town are asking them to do. Um, and they really sort of manage, do like the operational management of the project. Um, so we're at the very early stages of that. And another question here that I'll, I'll answer quickly is the video for the finance committee meeting from Tuesday um, posted yet. It's not up yet, but our goal is to have that up today for those of you um, who want to take a look at that. But the, the packet and the presentation is up online. So that's a quick, quick answer there. So I have a, a hand and a couple more questions in the room. Um, more I would like to know, is it possible to decentralize the DPW, putting the offices at one site and storing the vehicles at another? I think the fire station is badly needed and it's being held up by not finding a place to move the DPW. So, so yeah, so that the, those two projects are linked because we know that the current DPW site is the right location for the fire department. Um, we plan on moving forward on both of those projects um, in the current, in, now, uh, very soon. Um, yes, DPW can be uh, separated. It's not the ideal situation. Um, and the big issue is not the office space, it's really just finding a site that's big enough to accommodate the, the DPW operation that we have. Um, and the second thing is, is the size of it then. And also it's, it's, it's a site, we did have a real, really good site, but um, it was decided that that was not a, the site that we wanted to put the DB, DPW because it's a tough site to, to locate because it, it impacts, um, it's a 24 hour operation, it impacts neighborhoods. And so um, there are, there's very little open space that's available for the, that has 20 acres or whatever we need in the town of Amherst. Um, so that's, we will be issuing an RFP shortly to see if there's any space that we have not identified um, so far. Um, so you know, we know we have to move forward and the council has been very clear and President Griesmer has been 
very clear, having served as chair of several um, fire department study committees and the most recent one, in fact. Um, and this is a high level, high priority for us um, to move forward on. So we can we know where we want to put the fire. We can start the schematic studies for that location, and then we're prepared to look at DPW, even moving it to a temporary site while we can move these projects forward. I just want to remind the room we've got about 20 live attendees right now, um, and feel free to raise your hand or use the Q&A function. I do see a phone call. Uh, phone someone has joined us from phone with their hand raised in the last. Um, Four numbers of your phone is 6922 if you'd like to unmute and introduce yourself. And to unmute from a phone, that's going to be star six. Hi. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Kopicki. Thank you so much for taking my call. So um, I have a comment and, uh, uh, and then a question. So a lot of the uh, assumptions in the model that was uh, presented uh, are, uh, I, I don't know that we can meet them. Uh, one of them is that the percentage of the, um, the levy that we uh, contribute to capital would increase to 10.5% per year for into the foreseeable future. And we haven't been able to meet that at all uh, in the past. Uh, another is significant reductions in both the fire and DPW uh, budgets. And I, uh, we're, we're talking going down from 24 to, to 15 and from 38 to 20. And I'm not sure if that, uh, if there's an actual realistic plan that could do that. Um, there's also other increases that we haven't talked about yet that not only to our water bill uh, and one possible debt exclusion override, but possibly two. And then there's going to be increases to our sewer bills as well because of construction projects. So there's, uh, I think that there's a lot that is really optimized in, in your assumptions that may not be realistic. So given that, and given the fact that there are much more than these four capital projects that you, you're speaking about, um, there's Crocker Farm, which has $9 million of necessary repairs and $20 million in order to adequately serve the 40% of kids that could possibly be there with the school project. Do you think it's important to get the residents' opinions about what to prioritize uh, in terms of operating budget or in terms of projects moving forward? at this time, especially given all the changes that have happened in our lives from the pandemic and other reasons that people might be financially stretched. Thank you. Yes, those are really good questions, Maria. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the model that we presented was a model and it, it, it's based on certain assumptions which you identified. Um, you know, we uh, Sean has looked. Sean can I talk about where the numbers came from for the police for the fire in DPW. Um, those are comparable to other cities and towns that are building facilities. Um, it won't be everything that we want uh, in those facilities that were what that our department has want. Um, but sometimes you just have to build. You have to say here's your but here's our budget and here's what we can afford to do, and that's what we're we're saying at this moment in time. This is what we can afford, um, and we can build things and say let's build this temporary structure until we have enough money to build something else. We do that for our homes already. Um, so it's not that much different um, for our department heads to say, we have to scale back our appetite a little bit on this. Um, is, it, is it doable? Uh, there is a lot of uh, unknowns. Uh, we don't really know the impact of a net zero um, uh, on our constructing our buildings, how much add that is to any, con any construction project. There aren't enough out there to give us a real strong uh, evidence for that. Um, so, uh, and, and there are other projects that are coming down the road that, um, you know, like the Centennial Water Treatment Plant that are, that we have to do if we want to keep our water going. And we have to do the sewer projects if we want to make, make sure our wastewater is handled properly. Those are there whether we like it or not. And those are paid for through the enterprise fund um, and through our water and, and sewer bills. And that's based on the amount that people use. The advantage of that is that we also have our large nonprofit users 
uh, Amherst College, Hampshire College, and UMass, who use those services as well, and they pay their fair share of those added expenses. So they, those added expenses are spread out over a larger number of, of, of users, not just the taxpaying public. Um, Sean, is there anything else you want to add? To yeah, I'll add, a, I'll add a couple things. Um, so one of our next steps with the DPW and the fire station is to work with designers to have them. So they've, they've done a certain round of sort of feasibility and, and, and design. We want them to go back now and do it with budgets and with um, net zero, which the last time around, I don't believe that was factored in. Right. Um, so we want to see what we can get for what for those amounts. And then then we'll have a discussion about the trade offs and um, whether that's um, satisfactory to the to the town. Um, and, you know, the other thing I just I always think about is delaying projects or not doing them is not going to mean the costs are going to be less. Um, they may be spread out differently. Um, but in most cases, it's highly likely the cost could be more. If we push these projects down the road, there could be higher interest rates. With further out, there's more cost escalation. Um, again, we, we have a recent example to, to look at to see how pushing a project back, what the impact on the cost is. And, and then the other big thing is we, there's lots of other buildings in town that are you know coming down the pike um, 20 or 30 years from now that we want to make sure this wave of these buildings that need to be addressed, which, um, which we've heard from a lot of people, they feel they do, um, that they're off on their way off our books and so that we don't have a, a big debt load when we have other project building, building projects come up in the future. Um, so we're, you know, we're thinking about now, but we're also looking down the road 30 years and trying to make sure we're in a good position then as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point because, you know, I think, um, typically, you know, we haven't built a new building since 89 when the fire, the police station was built and, um, you know, I think a community like this, we should be looking at taking on new debt for a new building about every 10 years. We do have um, significant other buildings that are in their 30, 40 year lifespan that in 20 or 30 years, the, the our, our, our successors are gonna be saying, how do we pay for this project? So for us to tackle the projects that need to be tackled now is really important. And we're not gonna be able to get everything that we want, but the town has, asked for a lot. And so we're trying to build as much of that as we can. And then until we get into the design stage and dig a little bit deeper onto some of these things, um, you know, the town, we, we need, we as a community um, need to uh, consider this. So, and then you, the earlier question, Maria was like, how's, how do people weigh in? And every, we have 13 elected officials who are highly responsive to the public. They are the decision makers on this. The town council is the one entity that's going to say yes or no on how we move forward. Um, they are very good at, they've each, every one of them has had district meetings, has attended, they're very, they're very well good at listening and reaching out to the public. So that's the way you convey your, your interest and in, in your, your sentiment on these projects. Great, thank you. So I have another question here. Interest from the library's endowment is essential to paying the library's annual operating cost. If the library borrows against its endowment in order to pay for capital funding on its proposed project, does the town plan to increase its annual contribution to the library budget in order to meet the library's operating costs? So Sean can address it. So they're not, they're not borrowing against the, the endowment. That's not the way it's gonna work. The, 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 the funds from the Board of Library Commissioners is different than a lot of other funding sources. Do you wanna talk about that, Sean? Um, not? So or I not. would just say in terms of how much um, the annual con contribution is, our approach has <laughs> historically been, and I think is would continue in the future is we give the same allocation to all the de departments. Um, so that's been our approach around budgeting is to, um, you know, if it's a 2% 2, 2 increase for the schools, it's a 2% increase for the town, it's a 2% increase for the library. Um, I don't know if that's, if that was answering the question, but. So, so I guess what I'm saying, the endowment will still be in service to the library to, to where they can use the interest to support their, their, mm -hmm. their operating budgets. But, yep. um, you know, what, you know, and the assumption is that they will raise the money, but the I think the council is going to say, "Well, what's your your assurance to us that you're going to raise the money?" And they say, "Well, we have this endowment. If they have to dip into the endowment to pay for the the capital, that's a significant impact on their operating budget." But they no, they're not expecting to have to do that. And more and more can be learned about that 
on Monday's um, meeting is that the entire presentation is going to be from the Jones Library about the Jones Library project and funding. Yeah, it's like an hour long presentation, I think. I haven't seen it, so. Yeah, yeah, it's a very um, in-depth um, presentation that has a lot of focus on finances and, and then what the building, um, what's going on with the building project. Mm -hmm. And that's Monday evening. It's on our public meetings calendar. So if you if you head on over to amersma.gov and to the public meetings calendar for Monday, all the information should be um, there if anyone's interested in digging a little deeper into that project. And Paul, I just want to say you mentioned earlier about counselors. Um, we do have several counselors joining us today. And I just want to, if they feel comfortable, if they raise their hand, we'd be happy to um, hear from them as well. So counselors in the room, feel free, raise your hand and we'll bring you in but you're buying coffee if you come in. <laughs> oh, there we go. So I'm gonna invite council president, um, Lynn Griesmer to the room. Good morning, Lynn. Good morning. I'll be glad to buy you all coffee. <laughs> um, I just wanna mention that we will have the presentation and it is already in the council packet for Monday. It includes a uh, taped presentation that the library spent a fair amount of time. They shared the outline with me. I went back to them and made significant suggestions on timing and what they needed to focus on. And in addition to that, they have taken the time to answer a three-page memo from the council that included a significant number of quite detailed questions. And that is in the packet as well. The thing that I really wanna emphasize, however, is that on the town website, if it's not there, it will be. There are going to be two public forums that the uh, library will be the focus of the public forums. And those are on the 3rd of March at six o'clock and on Saturday the 6th, I believe mm -hmm. at two o'clock. Yep. And those will be at least two hours. We want all the questions that you can possibly have and then some, and I'm sure you'll have them. And the library is prepared to, and the library will be joining us in those public forums and able to answer those questions as well. Um, the other thing I wanna also mention is that uh, Sean Mangano on behalf of the town has spent a fair amount of time both talking with the Mass Board of Library Commissioners about how their loans work and or excuse me, how their grants work. And in addition to that, working with the town's financial advisor in terms of how the finances or the model work. Um, so I just wanna really thank Sean um, on behalf of all of us for all that outstanding and very detailed work. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for popping in. And you can send that coffee right up the road any point today. <laughs> Your neighbor. <laughs> I'm going to um, take another chance to remind the, the room. Um, we still got plenty of time for questions. If you want to raise your hand um, in Zoom, star nine from the phone, or pop questions into the Q&A. Let's see. I have a, a couple of questions that are here that are kind of off topic, but if we want to stay on the financing piece for now, we can. We take the other one. We can go on the other ones if you want. So <clears throat> this question states, I've read about vaccine doses mm -hmm. at some locations being wasted because they expire before, they, <clears throat> before being administered. Has this been a problem in Amherst? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and I have read some of those same things. Um, we um, we are really we're on a much smaller scale than a lot of the other vaccination sites. So, um, and our our folks are showing up when they they say they're going to show up. So the um, health department knows exactly how many doses to have available. Sometimes, if they there might be a vial that has a couple extra doses, um, if and sometimes people show up or they don't show up. Um, so they do work with um, making sure that every uh, vaccine is distributed. If someone had tried to sign up for a, um, a, a, a an appointment on that day and wasn't weren't able, they if it looks like they might 
um, the health department could reach out to that individual and say, hey, are you available to come in and get a dose? Um, but they've been pretty good at, at just sort of manage it, managing it down. Okay. Um, so more, more questions rolling in. Back to the finance um, discussion. Is there a typical pattern of investing in town city infrastructure? And is our tendency to put off capital investment unusual? What would be the best practice? So I'll, I'll start with, um, and then Paul can hop in as the finance committee a while ago, and, and I see Andy's in the room, um, they had set a goal to get our capital spending to 10%. And that was even before, um, you know, talking about these building projects, that was just for maintaining capital in general. Um, so we've been trying to get to 10% for a while. Um, and we, we were almost were, oh, there. And we were almost there before the pandemic hit. Yep. The, the we would have been the there. Pandemic, we would be there this year. We would be there right now. Yep. Um, so when we talk about getting to 10 and a half, we were basically there um, and the dip in revenues caused by the pandemic kind of dropped us down for a year, but we're more or less just getting back to where we would have been um, a, a little bit higher than where we would have been this year if it wasn't for the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But the question is, is this, so debt is used to purchase buildings for cities and towns. And the logic on that is that um, if you per, if you build a new building, the people who are using that building over the next 20 or 30 years are getting the benefit of that building. And that's why you use debt. So the people who are there utilizing the building are paying, paying for that building over time. Um, and so utilizing debt is a, is a very, it's, it's every city and town uses debt to manage its, its large public infrastructure. And we do the same thing. I think where the town, where this town hasn't, where we've fallen a little bit behind is we haven't addressed some of the major capital projects as quickly or as early as we should have. Um, and so maybe decisions made 20 years ago before anybody was on, you know, in this room was really involved, were, were, we could have been more aggressive about addressing some of our um, infrastructure needs. I think it's a lesson learned going forward is, you know, we're looking at things 30 years from now. Um, we don't want the people 30 years from now looking at our decisions and saying, why didn't you do something then? Now it's much worse for us. So that's why it's important for continuity of government and for the looking forward to plan to the future to address this capital needs that we have right now um, so that the people who are going to come after us have that the benefit of our of the infrastructure that we've built for them. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a professional manager. I've been in public service. Um, I'm a trained planner. Um, when I see something that's been that my forebears have have done, and I go, "Wow, that was really advanced planning." I really appreciate that. Um, I look at our wastewater treatment plant. It was it was really has large capacity, and at the time they built it, they probably didn't think that they were going to need that capacity. But thank goodness that they had the foresight to build it at the size that they did. Really smart thing to do. So there's decisions like that you see, and you say, "Wow, that was really good that they did that." And we want to be in that kind of um, situation going forward. Quick follow-up to that is, <clears throat> what was our percentage before? We have an attendee asking. So I think we were at nine and a half percent in FY20, and we mm -hmm. were going up to 10% for FY21, or we're fully committed 10% FY21 yep. in February before everything sort of tanked. So we were right about there. Um, and the one thing I'll just add to what uh, Paul said earlier, we also have this unique opportunity where we have all, all these projects that, um, you know, are facing us and interest rates are also at yeah. historic lows. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. I can't tell you how big a difference an interest rate makes in the, the overall cost when you, you know, you're borrowing over 20 or 30 years. Um, you know, some of the rates that I've been hearing from our financial advisor of some projects that are the same size as ours, you know, they're in the, the low one to 2% to range. Um, and if we can take advantage of that, that really makes a makes a huge difference in that model. It can make that model get a lot better um, and a lot more um, uh, palatable to the town if we can take advantage of those low interest rates. It, yeah, that's, that's a huge point that the interest rates drive so much of this and the strength of our town right now, we have very strong reserves. We have um, strong management, all the things that the bond rating agencies look at, um, you know, our, our economy, even the, in this dip and the whole community 
country is looking at it, we our financial advisor feels that we're um, very well poised and our auditor has said the same thing to get a really strong bond rating, which will lower our interest rates as well. So right. that's why timing is really crucial right now. So I do see we have Councillor Steinberg's hand raised. So I'm going to invite him into the room. If you could unmute. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, I too will uh, look forward to the time when we can all be together and I can actually buy you a cup of coffee. <laughs> we're, 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 we're looking to that day. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the history a little bit from my perspective goes back to when I was appointed by Harrison Gregg to the former finance committee that was a committee of town meeting back in about 2008. And at that point, uh, we really just engaged in our planning process for a number of things. Uh, John Musanti had just joined Amherst as finance director and uh, took a very different perspective on how we should go about looking at policy and planning and uh, had the finance committee work to develop what is now the town's uh, financial management policies. At that point, we were uh, spending around six and a half to seven percent on of our uh, tax levy uh, for capital. And we realized that um, it was not sufficient. So the goal of 10% was uh, established then. And it really was a work in progress to move that up so that we would do it without um, affecting uh, unduly the operating budgets. Um, and uh, one of the many disappointments besides uh, not being able to get together in person for these Cup of Joe, Joe with Paul's uh, events is that uh, uh, we lost our uh, plan to finally get to 10% in the current fiscal year as was previously noted. Um, as far as the, the major building the projects, I'd point out two additional things. One is that um, it's always wise to look to grants when they're available to um, supplement the ability to build buildings. And uh, we don't always choose the timing. Uh, the Mass Board of Library Commissioners and the MSBA each have unique processes which determined in part the timing of the project uh, applications that we've had. And uh, the other two buildings have just taken a lot of time in the planning because of the difficulty with finding the right location um, for each project and then the right location for a DPW facility. That's, that's right, Andy, thank you. And yeah, I mean, you bring such a long history and perspective to this um, and, and acute financial mind also. So it's really beneficial to have you and the other members of the finance committee there asking those the questions that some of the questions we've heard this morning, in fact. Great. Thank you, Andy. We have another question here in the in the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to ask this one as we close to our nine o'clock end time. Um, but feel free this for anybody who has a, a question or a comment. Now is your chance to um, raise your hand or put it into the Q&A. So most people would probably agree that a new elementary school is more essential than a $50 million pr total price for an 18,000 square foot increase to the Jones Library. What is the thinking on giving citizens an override vote for the school rather than for the library? So I'll, I'll take the first part of that, which um, I, I don't believe it's a $50 million project. Um, the last I looked, and, and again, la Monday's presentation, we'll talk about that, but it's um, 36 altogether, and then the town share would be about 15.8 of that 36. And then, you know, as to why the schools are the debt exclusion, so at least in the model, it's because the schools are the largest project. And if you, we don't do a debt exclusion, exclusion for the schools, then, and try to pay that out of cash capital, there wouldn't, we wouldn't have enough cash capital um, for the other three projects. 
Um, even if we did a debt exclusion for the library, we still wouldn't have enough for the other two projects. Um, so really the school taking that one out and having that be a separate debt exclusion allows us to do the other three projects within our the existing capital uh, that we're planning forward. Yeah, and so the mission put before us um, by the town council was show us a model that allows the town to move forward on all four projects. And that's what that model that was presented does. It's, it's a plan. It doesn't mean it's the way to do it. Ultimately, um, what goes out for a debt exclusion override is up to the town council. They're the ones who, make, who decide what questions go on the ballot. Yeah, and just a quick follow up on what Paul said. You know, we put that model out there with the intent of spending a lot of time explaining it and getting feedback. And then also with the intent of refining it, it was not meant to be here it is, it's not gonna change and, and we're stuck on this. We wanted to hear people's feedback um, mm -hmm. and, then, and then refine it going forward. So um, we shared it, we're, we're engaging people and that's gonna to start today. And then we're gonna analyze what we get back um, in terms of feedback and then refine the model again. So now that we're, we're coming up um, to our hour, Sean, Paul, are there things that you can, um, what are the next steps for people who wanna follow along with the project? what's out there, what's coming up, um, and how do people stay connected? So for the four building projects, um, again, I'll just um, state again that we're, we're putting up a website focused on the four building projects that will um, have links to more information. It'll also have calendar dates of opportunities coming up that are related to them, or that we have a couple opportunities specifically to um, just talk about this and, and just hear feedback. Um, so. We're going to push that out shortly, and that would be my advice is to, to, to visit that website, check it out, and, and see what works for you um, in terms of when you can participate. So, and, oh, go ahead. I was going I to just, speak. Go ahead. You, you go, Brianna. <laughs> okay. So what, what Sean's referring to is that we'll have a project page on our new um, public participation platform called Engage Amherst. Um, so we'll be, we'll be launching that today. Um, with this project, it's basically what Sean mentioned, lots of information and the opportunity for you to ask your question and get an answer directly from um, someone on our team. We'll also catalog other questions asked about the project from various meetings or other types of um, formats. We'll, we'll try to put them all there so people can see what's being asked and answered. Um, and that'll also be linked on the capital planning page where there is a lot of historical background information, information from those listening se sessions last year. Um, so there's some background there if people really wanna look at some of those details. Yeah, and just, I mean, it's a shout out to Brianna because in this pandemic, we've had to think how do we engage the public in a more um, robust way when we can't have in-person meetings. And that's why this new platform that she has figured out and has developed for a lot of our projects will be utilized. And it's, a, it's more interactive than just a typical website. So uh, it's an opportunity to really engage the public in a different way, along with other tools like I'm not sure if you've been in town, the SUFA signs where that has real-time information and we can do polling and things like that from those things that people who don't normally go to our website, There's, we're trying to get different ways to connect with folks. And that's absolutely right. You know, we've, we've done a great job of having our meetings and public comments. So what we're looking to do is allow avenues outside of that prescribed period for people to kind of give us their opinion and ask their questions. So more to come on that. Mm -hmm. um, just a quick comment in the room, a couple of people saying, thank you. Thanks for this information. Looking forward to hearing more. Um, so I think we're, we're at our hour now and any, any final words from Paul or Sean? I just thank everybody for showing up. That's a great turnout. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And we will put this recording up on our um, community chat playlist on YouTube in case you wanna refer back to anything or share it with a friend or neighbor. Um, and as always, if there's any questions, feel free to reach out to us um, via email, info at amersma.gov. We can provide you links to anything we talked about today. Great, thanks right. Brianna. Thank Bye. you. See you guys. Bye.